All right. How's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Bruce Russell. I'm the Wild Turkey brand educator, and I'm thrilled today to have with me um, two amazing women that are going to talk a lot about, I think, uh, a really interesting topic. Um, thrilled as Wild Turkey and Campari to be uh, kind of hosting and, and sponsoring this event. And as somebody that kind of grew up on farms my whole life, uh, I'm thrilled to hear about somebody that has chosen to to get into that full time and do that as a profession. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Chalky Tom. Hi, uh, my name is Chalky Tom. I am Pomo and Walker River Paiute, and I am the co-founder of Doom Tiki, which is a non-appropriative cocktail pop-up that fundraises, or fundraises, pardon me, that's what we call it, for various um, communities um, that are dealing with the after effects of colonization. I'm also an indigenous visibility advocate within the hospitality and drinks industry. And we are here today because uh, we're talking with Danielle Goldtooth. Um, she's a Danae mother, mixologist, farmer, and rancher who is fully committed to the, to the sovereign food movement and is the owner of D Deanna Food. God, I got that as close as I can, but I'm sure you can uh, fix that. And uh, she, today she's gonna show us how to be less wasteful and more connected to agricultural products and the regions of which we live. There are four things that we would like to ask fans of this content to do, which is to like us on Facebook, to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, to follow us on Instagram, and please comment below and ask any questions. And uh, thank you, Portland Cocktail Week, for putting this together. I'm going to turn it over to you, Danielle. Cool. <laughs> In keeping with traditions, I introduce myself in the center. If I do have relations that are out there, you don't have to me. And also, because holy people are always listening, and I, and I want them to know that I'm the one speaking. Um, I can go ahead and take up my first slide, if I could get that going. I'm not sure if I can see it. Can everyone see it? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, so we, we are. Perfect. So um, this has been a family journey. So, and um, it's been a huge undertaking. You can see my family there, my husband, um, our children, Kaylee, Camille, and Soraya. Uh, top left is us kind of taking care of some sheepies. And the bottom is actually my grandparents who have a huge part of what we're doing. So we've gone from living and working in downtown Phoenix to slowly taking on the family farm and suddenly moving to a cattle ranch. <laughs> um, so I used to be a glamorous cocktail, uh, craft cocktail mixologist in downtown Phoenix, and my husband um, was a gourmet chef. Uh, now he's a butcher here at a fa family small owned farm. And my children went from kind of a normal city life to becoming budding agriculturists. You can change to the next slide. So these are a few of the things that we're up to, just a few more pictures of the kids. My mom's in the top uh, hand right corner with uh, our youngest daughter, Soraya. Kaylee's there in the center holding on to uh, Navajo tea um, that we had foraged together. My husband and I on our family farm and my daughter Camille and I probably driving somewhere. Looks like we've got some hoes and rakes and such in the back there. But so we started our company, uh, DNA Food Start to Finish, with a vote from our entire family. Um, we, if we were going to truly immerse ourselves into this, we didn't want to just drag the kids along. So we explained what we were wanting to do, how we were wanting to do it to them, and we asked them if they wanted to do this with us. Because without a full commitment from our entire family, it was going to be really, really hard for us to not have so many tears, I guess. <laughs> um, but we want to be able to cultivate our own food and not make it just as a way to make ends meet, but to make it an important part of what we want for our future. 
uh, in this manner, I feel more confident in the tools that I'm giving my children to survive no matter what happens. Um, because they're learning all of the hard work that's involved around the ranch. They're learning tenacity. They're learning um, how to be able to communicate properly with other people. And above all, they're learning respect for the land, respect for the animals, and respect for what we are doing here. And for me, when I was growing up, that memory of uh, being on the farm with my grandparents and my mother uh, really kind of drives home uh, and guided my ship in turbulent times. And it's kind of like my North Star for gratitude, if that makes sense. So our mission statement for DNA is, DNA brings forward thinking gourmet cuisine that utilizes agricultural products produced by indigenous Americans, local agriculturists, as well as our own farm and ranch goods. Being a small hands-on company allows us to adhere to stricter personal guidelines on how we source materials, create menus, and hire. This will have a positive impact on the community that we serve in numerous ways. The goal in spotlighting indigenous American and a local agricultural products is to invest in the communities that we live and represent. Our investment in that community can have the largest impact if we are also telling that story of the food and the people who cultivate it. We have vested interest in the success of each farm and ranch and individuals we work with. We're a company that would like to be an example of food sovereignty and how one little place can have a positive impact. Working green is possible for the future. We would like to continue a legacy of working green and become leaders in the industry to ensure that there's a planet for our children and our youth. Working in an industry where there is so much waste, we're committed to safe practicing of nose to tail and root to flower whenever possible. We would also like to commit educating our staff community on how they're able to help without being pretentious or rude. And that's a huge part for me um, because I feel like when we have an education system for these things, nobody really wants to hear about that as they're having dinner. And it's uh, something that I, I, I take to heart because I don't want to be told how to enjoy my food or my cocktails. I just want to be able to do it. Um, so that's kind of where our start is. That's where our heart is for that. If we can have the next slide, please. Food sovereignty to me is an idea of several moving parts. So, but the main pillar of my journey has been a Navajo philosophy that says, ego." it's up to you. Um, so the idea is the act of self-sufficiency. Um, and it starts with wanting a boot, better food system for yourself. On the slide here, on the left-hand side, you'll see my great-grandmother. Um, her name was, oh my gosh, I almost forgot her name. That was kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca Johnson. Um, and it's really funny because she's, she used to be my husband before she passed away. In the center there is my grandparents, Cora and Tony again. And on the right hand side is the restaurant that um, she actually ran as the head cook. And my grandmother was a waitress there for a very long time. Um, so I kind of have service industry in my blood and we, we've just always enjoyed taking care of people in that manner and in that fashion. Um, so after wanting a better food system for yourself and your community, it's the idea of having healthy, sustainable food available that's appropriate for the area that you live and work. It's around you. The traditional farming methods have animal and race. It's sacred. If I think it's gone a little okay I uh, you kind of faded out there for a second for me um would you mind do you know where I left off oh all right I guess it's just me and we're gonna uh be paused here for a second while we uh, recalibrate this
So uh, stand by. And you're back. We kind of left off after the um, hospitality bit, and then you were going into like a really good story. So oh, if you remember, okay. if you remember um, that part, I think we can go from there. <laughs> okay. So, oh yeah. So on the left-hand side is my grandmother. Center is my grandparents. We have the the restaurant there, but the the ultimate goal is for food to be taught readily to the next generation and for food security for each community based on their own natural resources. So that's kind of uh, what um, what that all means to me for for um, for that. Sorry, I kind of lost my place in my in my head. <laughs> well, also, I think too, like even within our community, like thinking ahead to generations is just something that's just deeply ingrained in us as a people. So, you know, it makes sense that you would apply, you know, that it applies to kind of like everything we choose to do, especially if we are, we're in this industry. Yeah, it's it's one of those one of those things. And I think the first question that I had the hardest time figuring out was, where do I start? How do I make that reconnection? And how am I able to to uh, be a part of that food sovereignty, being a part of my my community and being able to really get involved? And so when I'm seeing a lot of uh, people, you don't have a whole lot of jobs on the reservations. And so food sovereignty and food scarcity and food sustainability all kind of go hand in hand together a lot of the time. Um, so if I could, let's see. So where do you start? I could probably take the next slide now. Thank you, Chakli. No problem. So, uh, so you've actually completed the first steps by being here. You're curious and you're engaged um, in a topic that's super intimidating. Like I come from a community where this is what I grew up doing. We were ranchers, we were farmers, and getting into it now is still super overwhelming, even though I have had a hand in it and I've grown up in it. And so like, where does somebody start that has never even been able to do that, living in a city or a town and such? So, you know, it's uh, there's several ways we can start the food journey, but the first thing that you should know is that failure is inevitable. And that's with anything that you're learning brand new. And my brother said it best. He says, you have to get over the idea that you are not able to cultivate something. Um, this is something that has been done for generations. This is something that is available and ready for us. And as long as you have a little bit of dirt in a container, you can you can create something, which I think was a great way for, for him to get me out of my mindset of, I can't do this, I can't do this. Because when I told him about the journey that I was wanting to start, and uh, not just be in, because he's a, he was a sustainable major over at ASU. Oh, cool. And uh, he's able to cultivate food very easily. And for me to do it, like I remember sending him pictures, being so excited about my first little corn coming up. <laughs> and uh, I think that's some, something that we really have to remember is that we're all going to make mistakes. I'm sure that I am a plant murderer of many, uh, many, many plants. But... So there's several ways we can begin uh, a journey to food sovereignty. Uh, but, you know, I have a lot of failure, too. So some days I feel like I have it all together. Um, I think we can go to the next slide now. Yes, there it is. And so the first question that I started asking myself when we started taking this journey was looking into my fridge and asking myself, how far can I trace this food? Like, taking a, a carton of eggs, do I know where these came from? You know, kind of, uh, and for me, when I was living in the city, it stopped at the shelf. And that was really frustrating for me because, you know, I grew up in an area where I was able to buy local goods. I was able to buy um, all of these wonderful, wonderful things. And in fact, sometimes it was the only type of food that was available because of, uh, because of the space. There was the food desert that we were living in at the time. Um, but I'm particularly proud of these pictures here because these were three meals that we've had in the past six months that we did without trying because they were in our fridge already. On the top right hand corner, we have Chorizo from Double Check Ranch, which is the ranch that we currently live and work on. And then our friend Michael down the road happened to bring by some um, eggs. And so we just made a nice little scramble for breakfast. It's what we grabbed out of our fridge. Um, over on the left-hand side, we've got a uh, chicken that we bought at the farmer's market. 
Um, we went to Mortimer Farms, uh, which is a little area. It's a you pick it farm. And uh, and we went and we got some asparagus. And then the mushrooms on top we got from Safeway. But, you know, you can't have everything the way that you want it. <laughs> um, but what and then the last dish over there was actually a true potluck. Um, we were out foraging with a bunch of chef buddies and friends and, and uh, everyone was tasked with bringing bringing something with this and so an ingredient of some kind that we were either proud of or something that we had cultivated ourselves or something new that we had never had before and so what we ended up with was uh, um, one of our friends was a rancher and they brought out some of their ground beef um, we brought our um, steamed corn and so you can see it kind of speckled in there somebody brought some potatoes i think they were the they were the last minute people you know when you need chips from like the store yeah. that was totally them that was totally what happened with that but the, the, the lunch and the dinner itself became absolutely fantastic. And the other thing that I wanted to point out in this particular setting was that I have three different ways that I was um, interacting with food sovereignty. The first one being uh, self-cultivation and using exactly what was in the community. And in that very first picture on the top right, you're seeing this beautiful meal that was prepared by stuff that was here, none of it had ever seen a grocery store or the inside of a grocery store. And when I made that connection, I called up one of my friends I was like, oh my gosh, I just had all this food that we cultivated ourselves. Like I was almost in tears because that was, this is the goal for us, you know? And then going off onto the left, this was before we started the food journey when we had been starting to ask those questions about our food. And so you can see the, the changes in that. And then on the bottom right, I love that one because it has to do with friendship and community and community building while we were doing something that we really love to do, like when we're going out foraging. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, kind of the first step in my journey was to start asking the, the question, how much food do I know the origins of? And it wasn't really hard to find out different ways to kind of start making this more of your life, was it? No, it wasn't. And that was the most shocking part was I wasn't really going out of my way to figure this kind of thing out. It was, uh, you know, just making the right connections, talking with the right people. It's kind of like uh, how we have our, um, like we go, say we're going to one of our downtowns and we know our friend has all of the, the key places that we want to go. And so we give them a call like, hey, where should we go? I'm going to hit, you know, I'm going to hit uh, downtown Phoenix. One of my friends asked and we'll list a, a bunch of bars and say, hey, you know, um, this is, these are great places to go. And so once we we're able to connect with a community that was already doing these types of things, it made it so much easier for us to, to continue this and um, just be a part of it. Okay. Um, but I can tell you that we've got major failures, too, in that whole thing. It's really funny because, like, I have a box of zebras under my bed right now to hide from the kids. <laughs> but, you know, having that kind of thing there, it, it, it is a failure in my mind because it's processed food. It's something that we didn't cultivate ourselves. But it's also a necessity for some of us when we just need that sugar rush. So I, I don't really think that it's too bad of a thing. But, okay, we can go to the next slide now. Um, so here's a few of examples of the cocktails that I've done um, using, using these ideals, um, shopping local, making sure that I'm able to interact with uh, my community and um, doing a little bit of foraging with it. On the left hand side is um, going down the canyon, a cocktail that we use a um, citrus desert shrub in. And then on top of that, I actually have a candied barrel cactus that we did while foraging. And so candy that dried that beautiful. And then over on the right hand side, uh, this was my first attempt actually at um, utilizing a cocktail in the spirit of what I'm doing with DNA. And this was actually for a charity event last year. And uh, I taught a group of foster children how to can peaches. And so the peaches there were something that they had there for them. Um, the olive oil company had donated some olive oil for this beautiful venture. And then my friends over at uh, Three Rivers actually kind of helped out and sent over some gin. And then on the bottom portion there, um, we've got a little bit of the green thread, I think it's called in English, and uh, Navajo tea as I know it, and uh, made a nice tea out of that. Combined all of those ingredients to create this uh, really lovely peach flavored cocktail that had notes of juniper in it had sent some like undertones of that really beautiful tea that's there. And then just a tad of spice when you would get that oil on your lips from, from that. 
<clears throat> and I think it was a, a great example of seeing that you you are able to find things in your area and stick to strictly local. And it's it's a challenge sometimes, but it's also a challenge that's a lot of fun. You really think outside of the box, even though you're putting yourself in a box. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, do you have a suggested foraging guide? A suggested foraging guide? The one that I have time and time again is actually a regional guide and it's called uh, Southwest Foraging. Um, I can't think of the, the name of the author at the moment, but I can definitely, I'll put a picture of the book that I like and uh, on my Instagram later this week. Cool. That way we're able to, and I'll put a few of the book suggestions that I have um, throughout on, on Instagram. Um, do you generally um, suggest sticking to regional areas for this or finding resources um, that are more local for people oh, that are looking for these books? Yes, most definitely. The regions that we have are going to be completely different. Um, wherever somebody is, that particular region is going to have microclimates. It's going to have a whole bunch of other little you know, dips and valleys and such and different types of animals and terrain and the weather is going to be completely different. So you're going to end up getting a whole bunch because I doubt you're going to have a saguaro cactus where you're at, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> so uh, having a, a foraging guide that is uh, meant for your area specifically is really helpful. Um, and the other resource that I usually use when I'm doing like kind of the foraging such is um, getting into groups that are regional finding people who are going out to do that. And it's just a lot of fun. Um, in this slide here, you can see my grandmother and I, this was a few years back um, pre-COVID because we're, we've been having a really hard time being able to do our canning that we normally do at the uh, amount that we used to. So this was a few years ago and we like to do like apples, but there's a few different, um, different preservation tactics that we use with these apples. So if we can go on to the next slide, um, you'll see that we have a, we did a smoked apple shrub with a, um, what we did was we smoked a, um, we, we smoked a, a duck and we had a, um, a little bit of the apples underneath that. So you had all of that fat, fat rendering down on top of those apples. And then um, what we did with that was we created a shrub. So we ended up with these, with just the apples. We had this gorgeous shrub on the side, um, this wonderful smoked smoked shrub. And um, we're able to use that in a few of the different cocktails that we use. We've used it for vinaigrette a couple of times. And once we have the recipes down pat and we've got it written down, we can um, have some sort of, uh, what's the word for it? consistency in, in, our, in our products. So this is uh, one of the one of the things. If we go to the next slide. Um, so another way that we're doing this is we actually do canning a whole lot. As I was mentioning, my grandmother and I love to can. Um, and this slide is has the USDA government um, complete guide to home canning. And this teaches you everything about it, like the temperatures that you need to do, the water bath, what you can use in water bath canning, and what you can't. Um, so this is a guide that uh, I actually use still to this day if I forget something. Um, but it's a great it's a great way to do do any of these things because you're able to um, have these products that you have bought locally or grown locally or have picked locally and having them throughout a season rather than just having it, um, having it just for that short amount of time that it's fresh. So using preservation tactics in, in the sense is the best way that you're going to be able to kind of stretch your produce. And it, it keeps it from going to waste, um, even though there's other things that you can do with uh, some of these. I like preserves for cocktails a lot too, so. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it, it's one of my favorite things because you can add so many different, different things and it adds a lot of, um, it adds something to like if you have your bar program and somebody really likes like your applesauce that you're adding to an apple cocktail, uh, you could probably even sell that applesauce, adding a little bit more to your business revenue if you're planning ahead for that type of uh, type of thing. And that's something that we've talked about too before. So if we can go down to the next slide, please. So these are a few other different preservation methods. 
Um, of course, the canning there, we have the preserves, uh, apricot preserves. Top right, we got a bunch of peaches prepared for freezing. And then on the bottom, we made a ton of uh, peach syrup. And the thing that I like to mention about this peach syrup is you're using a boiling water to take off the skins of the, um, the peaches. And it's a, at a constant high temperature. We strained that and we actually used the, used the juice from that, added some sugar and made a syrup out of that. It had a nice viscous kind of feeling to it. So that was kind of a, kind of a fun one as well. But I think, I think it's a, I think it's great to be able to see all of the processing here and just know that it takes a ton of work. If you're using this for a bar program, I encourage you to take out your staff to go pick the apples or pick the peaches or something. Um, when we're in those little uh, little spaces together for as much time as we are behind a bar in the kitchen or on the service floor, um, having that camaraderie is really helpful. And taking a staff out to like do some of these things really helps with that um, with that boost, and it kind of gives a person a sense of ownership as well. Because when you say, "Oh, I helped make that," like you can see it in a lot of people's faces, you you get excited about it. You get a yeah. little bit more excited about a product when you've made it yourself. And so to have that little piece of ownership in a business, I think is a really great way to, um, to help out with that kind of, you know, camaraderie level for people. All right. So we can go on to the, to the next slide. And this is, uh, this is probably one of the more uncomfortable portions of this for a lot of people seeing an animal from beginning to end. <clears throat> and it can be super jarring too, but it's a crucial part of the journey to food sovereignty if you're a meat eater. And I say that because we have a lot of brothers and sisters out there who are non-meat eaters, you know, so got to put that out there for them. Um, I and also think um, developing that relationship with, you know, what actually happens to me is, should be a healthier part of being a meat eater. Oh, I completely agree. You know, I've taken on this responsibility of being a slaughter woman and uh, working at this small ranch. And a part of it is, you know, having to be here to help raise the animals as well. And um, it gets really difficult sometimes because you do form connections and attachments. And to kind of put yourself in a mindset that you need to be able to um, to get to get these animals from point A to point B in the happiest way that you possibly can, while also keeping kind of that emotional detachment in some senses. So that's one of them. And then the next one, I believe on the slide is going to be the, the cattle portion. And this is what I do here. And I'm gonna get excited about this just for a second because this is my job right now. <laughs> and uh, it, it is exciting for me to be able to to see something from the very beginning and the very um, end of it. <clears throat> so over on the top left-hand side, you'll see the animal quartered. Um, these are probably over, oh gosh, the, 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 the system that we have is up to two tons and this guy was a little bit wonky on there. Um, so what we do is we'll have the, um, the animal come in and it's really nice because the animals live here on property. They're not really getting anywhere too far from the thing. It's a low stress situation. They're all grass fed, grass finished, and they live very happy lives. We try to do the best that we can to make sure that they're living happy lives. And so when they're coming in, um, it's just, you know, they know that that door leads somewhere that they don't come back from. They don't know what it is. That's how I think about it anyway. Um, but my honey, uh, Alan in the top right hand corner has been um, going from a chef and learning how to be a butcher, um, learning from a gentleman who has over 30, 40 years experience. And so he's actually in the processing facility right now, um, breaking down an animal for sale. And this type of interaction is what I meant by we've kind of gone on the extreme side of our food sovereignty, going down to where we're even um, helping produce food for the public. And uh, we can go ahead and change to the next slide now. But I think it's an important that we see how these animals are processed. Um, I have appreciation for the trade that I otherwise wouldn't have. And you better believe that we use all the products that we possibly can off of each animal. Um, these are a few of the, the things that we've made. Um, of course, the beautiful brisket that we've smoked. 
the bottom is um, bottom right hand side is one of the finished dishes from for DNF for a 60th and um, a 60th birthday party. And uh, that was a seven bone that we had simmered down and made this uh, beautiful demi glass for it on top. And then we had a few other beautiful things. I wish my husband were here. He'd be able to tell you a little bit better about the food than I can. I, I do the cocktails. He does the food. But I'm very proud of um, the food that we produce, too, because we all have a hand in it. The kids, me, him, and we're kind of a, a five-person team, um, the baby being the 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 the, the tiny tyrant, I guess we could call her, Soraya. <laughs> um, but yeah, These so are beautiful too, and they look delicious. Yeah, and this is all grass finished, grass fed, um, and each one of these cows that had come through, like I personally slaughtered this cow. Um, Alan personally cut down these cows, so we're able to have a better handle on each of the products that we're giving to our consumers as well, which I think is super important when you're feeding somebody. And to know that, you know, this, this animal was well taken care of and loved and that we can speak on that personally um, really helps out for what we're wanting to do. You can go to the next slide. Ah, here we go. So this is another one of our passions. We really enjoy foraging um, as a family and we make it a family activity. Uh, this here, it was a, was a pink sheath, uh, pink... Uh, the underside was pink. Oh gosh, I can't remember the, the specific name for it, but it was a silky sheath mushroom. And the smell on it was just amazing. It was about the size of my fist. And it was wow. just sitting in the center of a stump. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is gorgeous. We're, you're coming home with us and we're going to have some dinner. So if we go off to the next slide. Um, this was the same day. We were out getting wood, um, mesquite wood for a fire that night and just kind of enjoying ourselves. This is uh, wolf berries from our area. And uh, when you're foraging in, in this sense, um, we have a few rules that we follow personally. One of them is we try to uh, think in thirds. So one third for us, and this is per plant, mind you, one third for us, one third for the creatures who need this natural resource in order to survive. And um, the third is for the plant to be able to propagate, repropagate itself. So when we're taking these things, we have to be mindful about that. And I keep a small diary, um, just even if it's in my like my phone, I'll take a picture. It'll show like the GPS location of where this plant was. And um, and I'll write in my notes section for that picture, like what the weather was like and such. And it'll have a date and timestamp on there. That way I'm able to use it as a reference to be able to go back to these places and re-enjoy some of these natural resources. So we can go to the next slide, please. So there's uh, Alan and I picking. So um, part of our personal food sovereignty program is to forage what we can when we can. And so being able to do it in groups is another huge thing for us. Um, when we do have, when I was with uh, Wild Arizona Cuisine, part of our curriculum for our food program was that we were required to go on loops on occasion to go check everything. And it was a lot of fun because we had a caravan of like six people driving after each other. And um, just uh, it, it really did cultivate a different type of feeling for us who were doing it. And I think that getting back into nature and finding, um, finding your connection with that, foraging is a great way to do it because you're actually consuming something from Mother Earth that she's given you. Like this is a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful natural resource. And it's also one that we have to really maintain and be mindful about when we are going into nature. Um, we always try to take trash bags with us when we're doing this and uh, pick up and leave places better than, um, better than we had found it. So this is uh, one of those particular trips. So we can go on to the next next slide. And that evening, this was actually the dinner. I was going to put this one on one of my favorite slides, but I needed it for this one. But this is one of my favorite dinners that we had. You can see the mushroom down on the bottom side. We use the wolf berries in that. And the, yes, that is a beef shank also from the ranch that we're, that we're living and working on right there as well. So, what do wolf berries taste like? Oh, they've got this like kind of citric-y, citric acid kind of taste to it, but it's got like 
the sweetness to it. Um, and it just, I don't know. I don't know how to, it, it's like really good. Mm, what's a good candy? It, it's like, it's a desert candy. I have been wanting to try to pick those up and it's like a little sour tart sweet thing. If we candied those and added just like a little sprinkle of maybe some citric acid to it. Oh my gosh. I would just pop those all day. It's just ridiculous. They're really good. But so it has uh, some, that, that dish there was one of my favorites, the bone marrow on the inside after it. And this was the nice thing about this one. It looks like it was a lot of work, but honestly, we threw this all into a crock pot and just let it go all day. It's like I found the mushrooms one day. We found the wolfberries that same day. We threw it all into a crock pot um, the next morning. And, uh, and this is what we had for dinner. So when you're doing these things, as long as you know how long a product's going to last you, if you're foraging, you don't necessarily, you can use it straight off. Um, or you can figure out different, um, different methods. Like if you want to candy some of the wolf berries, like I had been talking about, or if you're wanting to, um, produce a syrup out of them or something too, that would just make the longevity of that a little bit more. Um, I love using syrups when I'm using foraged goods because it kind of stretches a lot more than the actual product would. So you're able to extract a flavor from there and more people are able to enjoy that flavor with like a syrup or even like a tincture and such than you would if you were giving them just the product by itself. So using, um, using those preservation methods are, is something that I, I find very handy, especially with my foraged goods. We can go to the next slide, please. So this is a, another thing that we've, uh, that we've done too, is um, when we went camping, we got a fishing license and um, the girls pulled out um, two little brook trouts and uh, they wanted to do something special with that. So when, when we had first talked about what we were going to be doing, and this was after we had taken the vote as a family that this is what our life was going to look like, um, we really wanted our kids involved. And so I couldn't find it. And she's going to be really sad because I'm a bad mom. But my daughter, Kaylee, actually has a picture of her holding this up and getting it and being super proud of herself because she was such the squeamish, girly squealer during the entire process of catching this fish. And so once we got it on the um, on the plate and it was all plated up, we have a... Um, so we started integrating also some of these uh, traditional foods that we wanted to showcase and highlight. But we wanted to do that with our children first. And so this picture to me just kind of represents like our foraging, um, our hunting, our fishing kind of uh, situations and being able to bring that. And this is something that we would like to do eventually just more in a more sustainable manner, maybe from a farmer and such to two people. Um, and we'll, we'll come to those hurdles when we get there, you know. <laughs> if we could go to the next slide. So when we're talking about cultivating food, like I said, it's super crazy. It seems like it's going to be super hard. But when we get down and we actually do it, what it really takes is a lot of time. So if you've got the time to do it, spend 30 minutes on a little pot with something in it, you're probably going to be able to produce something. So don't get discouraged if you're wanting to try to take this journey. There's several ways. We just happen to have a family farm. So we utilize that resource um, and my grandparents immensely. This year was the first year that we actually did Athazi beans. And so we did it in the method of the three sisters. I'm, I think I saw on your page that you actually have talked about this before as well, Chaki. Yeah. And, I've, uh, I've done a cocktail that was based on that as well. Oh, that's so cool. I want to check that out sometime. Um, but for this one in particular, this was the first time that we had done the beans in this manner. And uh, even like tried to do kind of something more uh, heritage style. So this takes a lot of work because I didn't realize, but you have to hand plant these. So the corn you plant first and you let that grow about two inches and then um, then after that, you plant the beans next to it and you let the beans start to sprout and then you plant the um, plant the squash. And so it's all a hand planting as you're going through. And the reason for that is the corn needs to be able to be the strongest because that's your base. And then the beans are climbing up that 
and then you have the ground coverage and it happens really quickly. That squash gets really big, super fast and it kind of covers the ground there. Um, I just wanted, since uh, our name is the DNS start to finish, that was the start of our beans. We've got the um, dried beans there that we made into kind of a, a hummus there. And the other thing I'd like to note on this particular slide is that we had several different things that were surprising to us when we started cultivating our own food. And it was how much more we were able to different parts of their growing season. So I never knew that we could eat just the little green beans and boil them just like you would a green bean. Um, we brined some of those. And if you look on the, the little thing there, you have a little bit of a, um, a brined pea pod on that. And that was, that was something that was extra for us. I was expecting to plant beans and, you know, get beans. <laughs> and I didn't think about all the little in-betweens that there were to get there. And then as it was coming up, my grandma was coming over and picking these things and giving me that. Uh, just to clarify for everybody watching, um, what are the three sisters? So the three sisters are um, corn, beans, and squash. And so if you're, and they say in my tradition anyway, that if you look at the star, that's uh, the three sisters are the Orion's belt. So if you look at oh, the nice. constellation of Orion's belt, you actually have the three sisters that are there. And um, they're there as, as kind of a story. They're in some senses, like even a deity. Um, in, in my culture, plants and animals can talk. And this was the before times before we kind of like ruined that, I guess. And that would go into the whole cultural of um, our creation stories and such. But at a, at a point, plant and animals could talk. And so our sisters were the ones who helped us be able to cultivate this <clears throat> and are still here to be able to um, show us the ways. And there's a lot of learning in that specific story as well. Um, one of the sister being the oldest is the corn there. And this was, this was funny because these were connections that I hadn't made prior to doing this, even in my own culture. So when we're talking about recultivating and relearning traditional heritage, some of these things reconnect myself into my own culture again. And this one, this one was probably my favorite uh, this year that we were trying out. And it's because we have the older sister, you have the middle sister, and you have the youngest sister, and they all have a job and they all work together. Um, the beans bring in the nitrogen to the soil, the corn's upholding the and uplifting the beans, and the, the youngest sister on the ground floor level is making sure that nothing is attacking them from the outside. And there's a beautiful story to go with it. Unfortunately, I don't think I didn't put that really in into my into my notes. <laughs> I'm Next sure we time. Can, we can do something fun about posting that on Instagram later. Oh yeah, for sure. I think that would be a great idea. All right. We can go to the next slide. So our big thing, your big thing, all of our big things lately has been corn, being able to do that. And uh, one thing that I've found is that I really enjoy red corn. And it's not one that you find in the store very often. It's not one that you're finding anywhere else. And I started ours off by with a one cob that was about that big, like five, six inches and took off all the kernels. And the first year we did it, we planted super late and we got maybe two or three other cobs and this year we planted five or six rows in this humongous field at the family farm and now we have a ton of red corn and it's just been a super blessing because learning how to work with a product that I've never used before or haven't had enough to be able to play with uh, really has showcased to me what I'm able to do and really opened my mind to what it is that I can do. I know that you mentioned that you've used uh, the corn silk in some of your cocktails, which I thought yeah. was really cool. Um, what we've well, done one is- One of the things I will say about that is sometimes some of our our foods and things can have some, they can be medicine. So I always like to research um, just because I know that corn silk can be a diuretic. So I like to re mm -hmm. remind people to use caution to research even when using foraged things to make sure that they're safe. Oh, for sure. I actually forgot to mention that. That was something that I had paying. Thank you for reminding me. Um, anything that we're serving uh, food and drink wise is something that we have definitely done our research on. Um, something that we have 
either had for generations and were knowing how to use these products um, or we're finding the, the right people to be able to research these products and before we're putting it out for anybody. And that's uh, probably the biggest, the biggest thing with being able to create your own food and find your own food is making sure that it's safe food. And that requires um, educating yourself. It requires um, going in and finding people who know about these products and know about this uh, produce already and is able to help you. I have a lot of mentors and I'm super thankful for them. And um, they have been along for the ride, which I think is just really great. Um, I'm sure you have a ton of mentors for yourself yeah. as well. <laughs> just, you know, just passing on information to the younger generations and learning from the elders and having those mentorships are just something that has just been deeply ingrained in my entire like life, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, uh, my grandma likes to tease me. She says, I'm a grandma in training. <laughs> Uh, you know, in the sense of like, I'm an elder in training. And yeah, so, uh, and so she takes my, my, my traditional education very seriously, which is really funny because um, she's a, she's a cross between a Christian and a traditionalist. So I have some really weird little knacks about that, but. <laughs> I think everybody's um, grandma kind of has that kind of vibe a little bit though. Right. That's so true. Too. But so she, it's just been a wonderful blessing having them in my lives to be able to help with all of this, because this is this is what they were passionate about. And for them to see me doing this, I see them so tickled about it. And I think that's the other part about that is revitalizing with um, with your elders and talking to them about what it was like when they were going through certain things, how they were able to secure um, food security and such. Um, during their lifetime, I think is a great question to ask our elders because they have a lot of knowledge that we wouldn't even think of. Um, and so yeah, this my, is definitely one of them. My grandmother really pushed the like, you know, tail to snout kind of thing because she went through the depression, you know, like mm -hmm. these things are unpleasant sometimes in history, but you know, it, it really makes you rethink about how you util utilize everything. Yeah. And I, I think that's the other part about it is like, we really get into, you can't talk about food sovereignty without talking about food sustainability as well. And that, that's a huge thing because when we're, when we're looking at these products, we're trying to use dry farming techniques. We're trying to use um, no pesticides. And oh my gosh, I can tell you, we didn't get squash this year because the squash beetles just destroyed them. And I was unwilling to put any type of product on there. So I'm still doing my research, still learning how to do this. And I think that's the biggest thing is that, like I had talked about earlier, you're going to fail. We just have to try again next year. That's really what it comes down to and just have that, that drive to be able to continue doing that. Um, let's see. Yeah, so you can. Oh, here we go. So these are some of my favorite things in life. One of them is our earth oven over at my grandparents' house. Uh, my great grandmother helped build a prototype of this. And so we were going over. Um, what she had done, and we recreated it. And at first, it was really funny because we were wondering why she left the top open the way she did, and oh, did we learn why? And it's because <laughs> we like to put in the corn on the top part rather than having to bend over and stuff everything inside. Yes. So, a little bit of modifications, relearning how to do things, realizing that my grandma is actually, in fact, a genius, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, what we have here is we utilize this in several different ways and we use it for uh, a preservation tactic called steamed corn. Um, in Navajo traditions, we will utilize this for uh, stews and soups and such. And uh, I'm not sure how long it can last. I can tell you that I found some from like 10 years ago and I decided to boil it and it came out perfect still. So it's got a huge and a very long shelf life. But this also shows you uh, the, the differences between the corn. So the young corn is there in the center. And what we did with that was um, we're using a um, kind of the same thing that we use to make applesauce with. And we made something called kneel down bread. And making it took all day. And we're using young corn for that. And the utilization, again, of different product or the same product at different points in their life is just one of those things that I've been learning how to do and relearning how to do. And so when you go on your own journey of uh, food cultivation, these are some of the things that you're able to learn. Um, we use the corn husk that it came in to wrap it. 
um, my cousin uses corn husks to wrap everything. It's really funny. I'll go to her house and her soap's wrapped in a corn husk. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, so using using um, products like that, we'll probably use them for. Um, I've always wanted to see if I could make a bowl out of it, but it just seems like a disaster waiting to happen. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see if I ever figure it out. I like um, them for garnishes. Oh, yes. They're beautiful for garnishes. There's even a smell to them that's just really, really perfect. And if you just kind of peel them off, some of the people can make like the little roses and stuff out of them. It's really kind of fun. Like the people who do the palm palm leaves, you know what I'm Yeah. That, yeah. that art is really cool. Um, but on the left hand side there where you see all of the kind of gray and the dark stuff, that's the steam corn. This is a, probably a 10 to 12 hour process. So after you've grown the corn, after you've done everything else and you've picked the corn, you have a fire that's going in that oven for like six to eight hours while you're picking the corn. And so it gets super hot in there. You're putting down um, corn husks. I think we can go to the next slide because I think I might have a picture of some of this processes. That's the end product. That's a uh, that's the steam corn from the red corn that we produced this year. Um, and it was a tremendous undertaking. And I think this year we only came out with maybe a five gallon bucket of it. And we have a, a 10 acre field. And that mostly had to do with the time constraints and um, the amount that we were able to get into the oven. Um, but the, the product there has a very beautiful taste, very different from anything else that anybody has ever had. And so showcasing these types of things, I think in my mind, um, you're able to not infringe on somebody's culture while still enjoying it with them. And so that's part of the reason why I like the, the cultivation of this. I'm able to share certain things about my culture that I'm willing to share and that I'm able to share with people. And uh, this product in, in particular uh, just gives me, you know, a good feeling because this is this was a community effort. My grandma came out, my mom came out, my my grandfather was there putzing around doing whatever. Um, my husband was there, our daughters were there. I think we had upwards of 15 people this year who were um, wanting to come out and help do this and take home some of the products for them and their families. And so it became a community effort in part because everybody wanted to be able to feed themselves with this. And so that's a that, that's been a huge joy is when I took over the family farm, we were able to do and cultivate more. So we have family members calling and asking, hey, can we come pick some corn? We have community members asking, hey, I noticed that you guys have some extra stuff. Can we help you maybe weed or something and we can come pick something? And so being able to to feed our um, feed our community has been a huge thing as well. And I just really enjoy that part of our journey. So our, our girls are learning hospitality in an ingrained sense of uh, being able to take care of our community um, on a very personal level and knowing that their hard work is actually going for something that's, uh, that's really good for themselves. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So we use, uh, this is this was for our home personal use. If you're wanting to do fermentation and such in a bar, you probably need some special licensing. And I know it's a regional thing. So if you're wanting to do this, I would check out with your local health department to see what you would need to be able to do any of these types of things. But for ourselves at home, we actually made a fermented hot sauce out of all the chilies that we had grown. And um, we're actually gonna make that uh, Christmas present. So we're gonna do a few little ounce bottles of that. And I think that that was, that was really great. Um, but the way that you can get involved with these, here's a potential, oh, you can go ahead and that, that slide's fine. Um, so this slide just kind of shows some potential waste products that we turned into, to, um, a potential waste turned into products. So here on the ranch, we have um, bones that are left over that we're not necessarily able to use for human consumption, or there's only so many broth bones people want at the market. And so what we've been doing is we'll smoke them and we make them into um, something for like the puppy dogs around. Uh, this ingenious thing there in the center is one of my all time favorite products that my husband created. And uh, we were working together and uh, it was a challenge at our um, that the owners of that particular restaurant had for us to look around and see what we could what we could do and what we could produce. And so his idea was to take the tops and tails of all of the um, the bell peppers that were there, roast them and turn them into a syrup. And oh my gosh, it is amazing. 
the the little doodads themselves, the little uh, bell pepper turn into garnishes. Um, I eat them straight out of the can. Like he has to keep them in the house now because they're just that delicious. I'll put them on top of a salad. I'll stick it on top of a burrito. I don't care. Like it goes on everything now. It's just really good. And then um, I had hit on this earlier about using the juices from when we were boiling like the peaches and making it into a syrup. So one of the things that uh, I, I did want to mention is that part of food sovereignty is the sustainability and using like the nose to tail like we were talking about earlier. Um, one of the things that we've done is we'll take inventory even of our waste and we'll see if there's something that we can do other, if there's other ways that we can utilize that waste. Whether it's uh, going into a program where all of our um, compostable goods are going to somebody who's able to use that, or if our food scraps are going to the animals here, it actually helps us out when we have people who are willing to, to do that. Um, inevitably, though, we always end up with like little food trash particles and everything like that. So if you're going to take take on that type of responsibility, make sure that you're taking on even the little details with that, because the details for us do matter here on the ranch when we're dealing with um, little sheepies and animals and stuff. Um, but yeah, so take inventory of your waste, see what potential products you could be using rather than just throwing it out right away. And that's really cool because now we, uh, because of the red bell pepper syrup and stuff, we have a new product that we're able to bring pretty much anywhere that we go. I don't know most even most grocery stores have or usually have, you know, bell peppers and such. So even if we're not cultivating it ourselves, it is a product that we can recreate anywhere else. So I think that, that that's really important too. And it's great for if you do have like some of those little things. I've thought about using carrot tops for the same way if anybody uses like a ton of carrots or some of those like root veggies and stuff. So just some ideas there for that. Okay, we can go to the next slide, please. And uh, so... I wanted to, to hit really quick. These are three different um, three different pictures of three very different ways that we are cultivating food. So the first one on the top right is from the family farm. We have a lot more room, a lot more produce that's coming out of it. On the left hand side there, this was my attempt at container gardening in, in downtown Phoenix. So I just had my little herb garden out on our little patio and they were all in little, uh, little pots and such. And then bottom right is uh, our daughter Kaylee with the onions that she grew in my mother's backyard. So she was super proud of those. I'm super proud of her for growing those. And uh, it just shows what you can do in um, different amounts of space. And again, she's like super proud of that. So we had to pickle them. I think they're still sitting on a shelf somewhere. But, <laughs> but that's a, a, one of the ways that you're able to kind of get into that. We can go to the next slide. And then these are a few of the cocktails. Um, and some of the earlier cocktails that I had been playing with when we had been talking, I had been talking a while with a friend of mine for more of a low ABV cocktail. And so we decided to use um, wine with a shrub and kind of put those together. That way you have um, kind of lengthening out that um, the ABV on the on the wine and making something that's enjoyable to sip on throughout the day and such. And then on the right hand side, I've got um, forged goods on the outside of that rim. Um, Another way that I actually like to stretch my products is powdering them, letting a lot of my foraged goods kind of dry and powder, and then uh, making making them into um, like salts and rubs and that kind of thing for our meats, but also putting them on like the rim rim of glasses and such, using like Arizona citrus with that. And that straw was actually really cool because it's, speak of more corn stuff, that's a corn husk straw that's in that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Sorry, all the flies. But this is pretty much the end of my presentation. Um, I'm really excited about what we're doing here. I hope I gave a few people some ideas of, uh, of what, what it is that we're up to, but also maybe inspired you a bit to, to look into food sovereignty, to see how you can be a part of a community, um, build communities around you, and uh, get back to being able to produce your own food. Um, whether it's a very small scale or if you're going to go out and um, support people who are producing food, like people can go out to the farmer's markets downtown and sometimes find me. Maybe I'll be at the farmer's market like I was last weekend, um, you know, selling the meats and such. And it really is a family effort. So when you're doing and putting in the time to go and look for these people who are doing these things, 
or learning about this, we get excited. Like I get super excited when somebody comes out um, and lets me know that they are wanting to to know about this or know about what we're doing. And uh, thank you so much to Wild Turkey for sponsoring this and for, to Portland Cocktail Week for engaging this conversation because I think it's a super important one and I'm very happy to have been able to show you a few things that we're up to and like I said hopefully given you some ideas. That was amazing. I learned so much and it was it was fun to talk about these things with you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, if you have questions, if um, somebody wants to do some questions, that's perfectly fine with me. I'm sure there might be some. I might have skipped over something that I meant to talk about or somebody's curious about this or that. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, there actually were a few questions in the uh, in the document that came up throughout the, the talk. So if you guys are cool staying on probably just another five minutes, I think we could probably get through them. Yeah. Cool. So the, uh, the first one here is, uh, have you had a favorite cocktail you have made with your preserves? Oh, gosh. Let's see. My favorite cocktail. Yes, I do. And um, actually, it's a favorite product that I created to make cocktails. And it's our desert citrus shrub. So um, I don't know if anybody's super familiar with shrubs or not, but it's a potable vinegar. So you're able to drink it. I like adding it with like some soda water a little bit. Um, and I'm usually using after everything's said and done, maybe about a half ounce to three quarters ounce just for flavoring and just for that tartness that that um, vinegar can add to add to it. But the desert citrus shrub, um, a friend of mine actually gave me a bunch of uh, uh, citrus from here in Arizona. And I was like, what am I going to do with this? So um, and going going in tune with our um, trying to be continue being uh, sustainable. Uh, my husband went and he I don't know what it's called when they take out just those little slices of the of the the thing and he used it for like a garnish for some plate up for whatever he was doing and then what was left was this like mushy inner thing and he's like I brought this home for you I thought you could do something with it I was like oh thanks <laughs> and what we ended up doing with it was we uh, put in the sugar we put in uh, we use a double double concentrated apple cider vinegar that I find at the Asian market and we added that to it as well as a little bit of a high proof alcohol um, doesn't really matter. It's just there for for um, um, preservation. And so you fill it up above the level of where the citrus was. We took those rinds that we were taking off the outside of it and we stuck those in there as well and then added some spices. I think we added a little bit of um, anise. We added a touch of kind of some darker spices. Some of the, the ones that you might think like not even necessarily pumpkin pie, but um, savory spices. Um, thyme, I think we had a little bit of rosemary in there as well. And um, I have the recipe, I just don't have it on me right now. <laughs> and uh, we added a little bit of the, what it made it the desert citrus shrub was, the citrus was from here in Arizona, and we had a little bit of the creosote. And I created a tincture with that, just using high proof al alcohol with the creosote in there. And when we were done and we were happy with where the shrub was sitting at about two weeks later, I added a few drops of that creosote to it. And that creosote just smells like desert rain because that is the smell that you get when you're out here in the Sonoran Desert. And it's something that's absolutely very beautiful. So when you have a desert citrus shrub, it just kind of, it's something that I could take to New York City and still have a taste of home from here, if that makes sense. So that is one of the fav favorite products that I do make cocktails. Um, as far as the cocktails are, um, not really. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because I feel like I get really excited for things and I get it done and then I'm already on to the next thing, if that makes sense. So I'm really excited for the next cocktail I make with it. <laughs> nice. Um, next question. Do you raise a specific breed of cattle? Um, the ones that we have right now, these are, oh gosh, they're an Angus cross, but I'm not sure exactly what they're crossed with. Um, our ranch manager here, Daniel, usually takes care of um, the, that portion of it. And us being a newer ranch, we're still kind of finding our footing for how we're wanting to, to do that program. Um, we just brought in somebody not too long ago who's going to be doing a breeding program here. 
but the details as far as that goes, all I know is that I fix fences to make sure that they don't get out. <laughs> nice. I'll throw them a couple flakes of hay on occasion and walk the fences to make sure that they're safe. But as far as the um, handling of them when they're coming through the chute um, to go into the slaughterhouse at that point in time, they're my responsibility. Outside of here, aside from making sure that they're in their fencing, they don't really require a ton of work, if that makes sense. So yeah. they're just they're they're kind of there. They're back growing about background noise for me for the most part. They've uh, they've been great background noise for this session too. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I have my sheepies over here just for fun. I'm going to show you what my, my what I'm looking at right now. Can you see those girls over there? Yeah. They're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fix that as soon as we're done here. <laughs> Very cute. Um. So you kind of already answered this next one, which was just what ingredients really inspire your cocktails. Um, you kind of answered that with the first question. So we'll go to the next one after that. And it's, um, do you have any advice for bartenders who want to connect with local growers, ranchers, foragers, such as yourself, um, wherever they might live? And then how can they start the process of connecting with and supporting these people? Oh. So a great resource, and I know that there's probably a ton of these. I've never actually been to Portland. Look forward to eventually getting there. Um, but farmers markets. The very first place that I went when I was uh, starting this journey was actually going to the farmers markets. And I was very lucky in that um, the restaurants and bars that I had previously worked at already had um, sustainability things in, in their programs, in their bar programs, in, in our food programs and such. So I got to, to learn a lot from the people who... I was working for and uh, the way that they were cultivating their um, cultivating their food programs was going actually to the farmers markets and having face to face with people taking cards if the person was just a salesperson or didn't really know a whole lot about the product and finding the people who were actually behind the scenes and doing the actual work um, and so that 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 particular thing has really served me very well when I'm going into a farmers market seeing if uh, the owner's there, shaking hands with the owners of the farm, of the ranch, and uh, just generally saying, hey, I'm interested in this. And then the other thing is, if you're wanting to get more involved, um, most people do love having help. Um, one of the curriculums that we have for our bar program is if we are getting produce from, say, a warmer farms, which is far on the way, I would probably ask uh, the owner, Sharla, hey, Sharla, could I come by? I want to help um, help out so-and-so with this or this. That way I'm able to reconnect with the way that you're growing things. And just opening up a conversation with the owners or the people who are there and offering to help, like literally taking the time out of your day to drive to a place, show up when you say that you're going to show up and put in some manual labor. Because these places are extensive, they're large, they're overwhelming. And uh, you're not going to find people who are going to usually be able to come to you. You're going to have to go to them. So uh, being able to go to them would be a, another huge portion in that puzzle. Um, as far as foragers and, uh, and the likes of them, some people are closet foragers. And uh, I actually met a lot of foraging friends on the trail, believe it or not. So if you're uh, into hiking and that, uh, just being generally nosy and hopefully not too obnoxious. I, I'm sure I've come off as obnoxious. Um, and saying like, hey, what are you doing? You usually end up with a really cool answer if you're in nature and they're doing something, um, whether it's like a water quality test, which I've walked into a couple of times, or I walked into a group of kids that were collecting bugs. You know, you just find some random things, just like a, hey, how are you doing? What are you up to? Can I help you? And it, offering help and offering gratitude are the two things that have served me the most in my journey. Um, finding the good in the, the hard situations and, um, and that. But yeah, that's a great question because that, that would be my main, my main advice is find them. Find what they need and help them with that. And then with foragers, like I'm always happy when people want to go foraging with me. Like super happy because it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we get up super early for. Um, the kids are usually grouchy. I would love to have a happy face come out with me, you know? And yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, once you get into the grind of things, people will always say like, yeah, I want to come with you, but they, they never actually show up. So that showing up part is, is a huge thing too. If you, if you want to go out, people are willing, but if you're not showing up, then that's a, 
that's always a bummer for me too, as a person who would love to teach or love to be able to be around other people. Cause we're kind of secluded here in this little tiny place <laughs> yeah. or a big giant place with no people. <laughs> and then uh, one last question. Do you have a tip on what stuff a beginner could try growing at home when first starting out? Yes, I do. So my favorite thing is uh, living in the inner city of downtown Phoenix. I had a very, very, very small area to grow anything. And I started growing lettuce. And the reason why I started growing lettuce was because it was a super big confidence boost. After I killed all of my corn, I killed all of my squash. The heat decided that it was just going to wreak havoc on everything in my world. And uh, I found something that was going to, um, if you look at the packets of seeds even if you're getting seeds from like a grocery store or your ace hardware or whatever you're wherever you're getting seeds from it'll tell you the germination times on the back like what the zones are for what um, where they can grow really well and uh, i suggest picking something that's only going to take a few weeks opposed to a few months for your first few growing that way you have that, that way you know you're like i'm not you know just this person who has a brown thumb, you know? And that, that was uh, the advice my brother had given me was to um, start with something that's gonna be a shorter time period to grow. That way you're able to see that growth and complete a growth cycle and build that confidence for yourself, knowing that yes, you can actually in fact grow something, even in a small little pot, even in a small little area. Um, the other thing that I really enjoy having is rosemary grows crazy. And I love rosemary, but I like having it in pots because if you don't, it just kind of goes kind of wild. Um, mint is very easily grown. So your herbs are going to usually be able to stick around and repropagate itself a whole lot of the time. I've even taken mint from the farmer's market and stuck it in like glasses of water and they'll give roots sometimes. So if you want to steal a, a sprig of mint from the bar and see if it uh, grows for you, that would be kind of fun. You can call them a... Uh... Have you ever seen those little signs? Mojitos in training. I want one so yes. bad. <laughs> so, but yeah, right. so that's, that's my advice. Herbs, lettuce to start, and then go from there. Very cool. Well, that's the uh, last question we had. So uh, let's do some end of video, end of video shout outs here. Guys, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you all if you all are going to watch this on VOD later. It's an amazing class. Um, if you enjoyed this, please hit the like or love button whenever you're watching this on. Show some love in the comments. If you want to see more Portland Cocktail Week classes like this one, uh, follow Portland Cocktail Week on Facebook. Follow them on YouTube. There's also at PDXCW on Instagram where they'll have all their stuff on there, and they will um, show you when the classes are going to happen and what they're going to be about. Um, and thank you both so much for this class. This was amazing. Thank you. Really appreciate being able to, to talk to you all and given that space. <laughs> Yeah, this was great. I just need to figure out uh, how to get on that Christmas list to get that hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys and uh, tune into the next Portland Cocktail Week session. Thanks. Bye. Bye.